Skyla from the roof of the embassy. There was supposed to be a radio announcer who broke into their satellite armed forces radio program and to say the temperature is 105 degrees in downtown Saigon and rising, followed by Bing Crosby's White Christmas. I never heard it. Um, I mean, I, and, and we were in the office that morning because there had been a curfew, so we were sleeping there. The radio was on all the time. And I looked out the window at one point and saw people with suitcases walking down the street. And we called the embassy, and they said, yeah, the evacuation is on. So, I mean, we had the radio on, and no one heard it. Um, but the idea was supposed to be that you would hear this on the radio right. and then you'd go to a ticker station or something? or You were supposed to go to a pre-assigned location. There were a number of locations around town. And you were supposed to, they were pre-assigned, you know, CBS would go to this location because it was closest to where we were. And we went to that first location and there was no one there. No buses, nothing. We stayed for about an hour. No one showed up. So we went to the second location. By this time, you just, all kinds of Vietnamese are following us because... They know that uh, the evacuation is on, the Americans are leaving, this is their last chance to get out. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you just you get total chaos in the streets now. So. Did, uh, how much, how many of your colleagues from CBS were on hand at this point? Or were you the main correspondent or was yeah, I think there were a couple of us. I mean, I don't remember who else was there, but I, I know Dick Threlkeld was there. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember some else, but who else was there? But there were, there were more than one or two. I mean, this was the end. Bruce Dunning was there. Did you have any trouble getting into the American embassy and, you know, that riot scene there? Yeah, I mean, it took me uh, uh, an hour uh, to fight my way over the wall. I mean, it took me an hour to get through. I mean, the first part, we were sh shooting what was going on and trying to get, you know, as we're shooting, trying to work our way forward. Uh, but after a while, I said to Keith Kay, who was uh, shooting that, and I said, look, forget the pictures, man. Let's just work on getting over this wall. Uh, it took us an hour to go cover a distance of maybe 15 yards. Uh, there were Marines at the top of the wall with rifle butts hitting people back, knocking them back over. It was total chaos. I mean, they, you know, I, mean I saw people coming out burning money. I mean, I saw a guy come out with an armload of uh, $20 bills armload, I mean, stacks this high, putting them in an oil drum and setting them on fire. Uh, it was amazing. So the Marines directed you up to the, how did you get out? I mean, well, it, I mean, it was a long process. I mean, yeah. it, it's, uh, I got in in the afternoon and didn't leave until, I guess it was dark. Um, but, you know, we just, I stayed in, to file, you know, and there was a phone there. And so I'm on the phone with New York. You know, describing what was going on, um, you know, at least for radio, so mm -hmm. they could use that. And, uh, and then at the end, uh, we went up to the top floor, and uh, I remember going into this this room and this long hallway, and uh, I think there was an ambassador's conference room at the end of the hall that was lit. And I went into this room at the other end. And there were all of these uh, newspaper clippings on the wall um, that covered, I don't know how many years, but you know, there were pictures of Lyndon Johnson when he visited, uh, different U.S. generals with, with different Vietnamese generals, President Nguyen Van Thieu, uh, all the slogans, Search and Destroy, Rolling Thunder, headlines from, it was a Stars and Stripes uh, newspaper. And the radio was on in there, uh, tuned to Armed Forces Radio, and they still weren't playing White Christmas. <laughs> and I walked out in the hallway, and there were all these Vietnamese sitting, as the Vietnamese do, just bent knees, you know, squatting in the hallway, waiting to go up to the roof. And at the far end of the hallway was that lighted conference room. And I thought of that... Uh, an expression I had heard so many times, the light at the end of the tunnel. And I said, there it is. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. And I went upstairs and got on a helicopter and left. You made your way to what, the South China Sea? Yeah, we went out, uh, I forget the aircraft. We, we landed on some carrier. Uh, I'm not 
not sure what, what that Did at any point did you were you fearful of not making it? No. Hmm. No, I wanted to stay, but CBS ordered us out. Oh, you did want to stay? Yeah, yeah. You didn't fear the Viet Cong or the... No, I called the enemies. Viet Cong I knew out there at, you know, Camp Davis, and, uh, you know, the colonel knew me, and, you know, and he said, you know, he said, Mr. Bradley, you have nothing to fear. And I said, you know, I'm not concerned about you. I'm concerned about the South Vietnamese, I mean, because right. they were going crazy. Yeah. And he said, well, you have reason to be concerned. I, because I was trying to arrange some way to get out of town to hook up with their forces or to see if they had a safe house, where would they recommend that I go. Uh, I was trying, doing everything I could to stay. And CBS said, nope, you got to go. Don't stay. 